Every year, hundreds of young people compete in North Carolina masonry competitions around the state. Over the years, winners from those competitions have gone on to compete successfully in national contests, regularly bringing championship titles home to North Carolina, where masonry competitions are a proud tradition and a big deal for students, apprentices, and masonry companies alike. NCMCA has created this video presentation for masonry instructors and students to help contest participants prepare for competitions by better understanding proven project construction technique, judging criteria, and scoring procedure. As a young man, your host for this session won important competitions as an apprentice. As a journeyman mason and partner in a successful masonry contracting firm, he has served as head judge and chairman for many, many masonry competitions, including the North Carolina Skills USA State Contest, the annual North Carolina State Fair Apprentice Contest, and the annual NCMCA Samuel A. McGee Memorial Masonry Apprentice Skills Competition. He is the immediate past president of NCMCA and serves as board chairman. And he is an officer in the Mason Contractors Association of America. Here is your host, Kit Huntley. Welcome, and thanks for you guys attending and watching this video. We are here today to instruct you guys and show you how a state competition project is laid. And through doing this, we hope you can take it back, show it to your students, and learn something along the way. With me today, I have Ryan Shaver, who's the Workforce Development Coordinator for the North Carolina Masonry Contractors Association. I also have Cliff McGee, who's a journeyman mason that works for McGee Brothers Company and is the Secretary Treasurer of the NCMCA. Glad to have everybody online watching today, uh, our instructors uh, in North Carolina and across the country for that matter. And we hope today that we can show you what we are looking for as far as full head and bed joints, uh, tooling and neatness, how we judge a project. We're just going to go through it today. Uh, that way you can take it back and show your students once uh, school starts back. So glad to have you today and I'm going to turn the mic over to our journeyman Mason who will be building the project today, Mr. Cliff McGee. Thank you, Ryan. Really appreciate everybody watching this video and hope we learn a lot from it after it's all completed. Uh, please try not to be too harsh on the guy laying it. Hadn't done this probably about 30 years, getting older. But um, just hope everybody can learn something from this and show it to your students and use it as a teaching tool in the years to come. Due to the circumstances in the world today, we're doing this virtually. All of us would much rather be on a job site or at a competition doing this, but due to the guidelines, etc., we're doing this virtually. So I hope you'll take the time to watch this video, share it with your students, and hopefully we can all learn something as we do this. Today we're going to be constructing a project that was one of three chosen for the 2020 NC Skills project. The project has got a nice mix of CMU block and brick. It'll be an excellent test to see how a student will perform using these different products together. It has a roll lock that goes across the top that is generally a pretty good test also as well to see how they perform in putting that on. That is always something that where the level comes out, where the plum comes out, it is usually in the roll lock where the mistakes are made. If the student takes this, uses it as they should, he will be an excellent test in his ability. Cliff is preparing the first course as we go through. This course will be judged as a contest, as part of the contest. It obviously is a very important course to make sure the project starts out level. And if you will notice, Cliff is putting full head joints on the block. Kent, you're exactly right. Uh, he's starting starting nice and neat. Uh, the way this project is designed, the blocker on their edge, and the reason we do that on a lot of projects, um, I know you don't see that on the job site, but the reason we do that on a lot of a lot of our contest projects is so we can tear it down. Uh, the forks of the forklift will fit inside there. We can normally pick those up and move them out of the, the Coliseum or arena, wherever we're at. So that's, that's why we start out this way. Uh, it works really good for us on, on getting the projects out. Ryan made the comment that he was starting the project out neat. This is something that the judges do watch as they're coming by. If Cliff takes this mortar and just drops it on the ground or leaves it laying, it becomes a problem for the whole contest. Then it becomes a messy work area. So he's keeping that cleaned up as he goes.
Cliff is taking his, getting his first course of brick level. But if you'll notice, once the level is removed, all of the head joints are 100% full. We're looking for at least 80% full, but here he's got those 100% full, which is something we're really looking for. This project that we're laying today has four blocks laid in the front of it. We're, Cliff is laying the courses of brick first so that it doesn't interfere as he runs his level through and makes sure that the project is level from end to end. As he's doing that, if you'll notice, the head joints are full, which is what we're going to be talking about numerous times today. But once Cliff lays these brick, he will go back and insert the block and make sure that it is level with top of the brick. The full head joints are, are key. Uh, a lot of, lot of students um, are taught that and then when they get in a competition or a, or a setting where they're, they're on display to a lot of different folks, they, they go to a single joint uh, on the job. You know, we call that a clip joint. So it's a really good point there. We want to we wanna really keep the head joints nice and full and uniform. And that's what Cliff's doing a wonderful job keeping them full and uniform. So um, we can show a slow motion of a full joint. Do you have a trial, Ryan? And I will demonstrate that. Yes, sir, I do. We're going to do a slow motion demo of a full head joint, what we're looking for as far as a full head joint. Uh, and Kent, go ahead and give us a slow motion of what a full head joint would be looking like. Ryan, we will start out with what we're not looking for. Yes, sir. That's a, that's a single head joint right there. They call that a clip joint on the job site. That's not what we're looking for. That, that will not get us an 80% full joint. And we're going to look for that in the contest. If we see that, if we see that multiple times, we're going to have to deduct, deduct some points for that. Let's show them a double joint, what a double joint would look like. So that's a, that's a fairly decent full joint. Uh, he run the trowel on the bottom side of the brick there. That's a, a three motion in that strike, and that gets you a nice full joint. So that's what we're looking for. When that brick pushes up against the brick that you're going to lay it against, you all of a sudden get a nice full joint out of that, and that's what we're seeing on Cliff's panel. Cliff has done what we've talked about several times. He's laid his end brick up, laid the two closure block in the middle. And while he did that, he buttered this block and the end of these brick and then buttered both ends of this block, setting it in place, ensuring that you get a proper fit so that those head joints are full all the way through. That is a point of contention. If you leave that open or don't get that field solid where the closure comes together, that's going to cause a water leak or a hole that someone's got to come back and fix. We get asked a lot when we have a project like this where it has eight inch block and we have to come back over it with the top of, uh, with face brick back on top of those. So I get asked the question a lot, can I fill that block in before I cross with brick? And my answer is we, we work really hard to get the brick count really close, but we always try to give you about eight to nine, ten extra brick. So my suggestion to you guys is, especially the students and, and, and talking to the students, is if you have a place where you need to put a couple brick in, Get a couple brick that have chips on them or that are damaged or something's wrong with them and, and use those in an area like that. So we've got a couple here that Cliff has set to the side while he's been laying and they, they're damaged. They've got uh, some chips off the corner and that just happens in, you know, when setting up the contests and things like that. So great place to use those couple brick is, is lay one right there and let it lean over and then we'll put the other one in right here and let it lean over. So now we've got some brick in the in position there that when we spread our mortar and get ready to lay the brick on top of it, we don't have the brick tilting or moving or anything like that. So that's just a one little suggestion we've got. Pick your nasty broke brick, put them in there and use them up. We are supposed to keep the project area clean. As you can see, Cliff has raked some of the mortar away that was left over. You can pick up that old mortar because you don't want to put it in your mortar pan and use that to fill that area in with. That will help get rid of that and clean your project at the same time. 
So that's a couple of tricks that we get asked often. If you put that brick in there, if you're cleaning up around the project, take that old mortar and stick it in. That way you're not using your mortar that you have in your pan, but you are getting ready to get the project cleaned up as you go. That's a great point too. You know, you can use all your, your mortar that you've cleaned up while you've been building the project and, and get rid of it there. Uh, Cliff has checked this thing and he checked to make sure it's thumbprint ready before he started striking the panel. So he checked it, he saw that he needed to start striking the panel and start from the bottom and work his way up. So you, you want to teach your students that, hey, you need to be checking that. You know, depending on how your mortar's setting, depending on the temperature of where you're at, where you're laying, check that as you go up. And when it gets to that point, do like, uh, do like Cliff did and jump on the tooling and neatness and start tooling out your project and, and getting that at a point where it looks nice and slick. Proper tooling can make all the difference in the world when you're looking at the general appearance when we get through. That is a subjective part of the judging process that is done by a two to three qualified masons at the end of the project and if you do the tooling and neatness at the proper time it will ensure that you get a better score on your project. Another part of general appearance that obviously is looked at and it almost goes without saying, a brick has two sides. You have the face side, in this case is very sandy. The back side is slick and it has these tracks that come about on the brick when they are manufactured. But we do look at that and we'll occasionally see a brick that has a close face edge to the shiner edge side as we call it. Pay close attention. I don't see any shiners here that Cliff has laid, but that is a point that we look for in general appearance that will take off as you go through. Make sure that you put the brick the proper side out. If we lay it that, you can see there's a drastic difference, but some brick we lay are much closer between the shiner side and the face side. On the front of this project, this has a polished block that we're laying in the face of it. If you can see, this side is much smoother than the back side. It is much like the brick themselves, there's two sides. So be careful when you're doing a panel like this, make sure that you get the proper side, which in this case is the polished side. This is a side that will be turned out. The three of the block that are there now are turned correctly, but you can see the difference between the two. Ryan, at this time, could you tell us how North Carolina picks their project contest for the state skills project? So the way it happens in North Carolina, the way it's happened the last multiple years, is the instructors meet early in January along with us. We all sit down together. We have a good meeting, talk about the skills. Our skills is normally uh, first two weeks of April, uh, right around in that time. And what the instructors do is they pick three projects, three different projects, uh, for the students and then about 10 days before the actual skills competition the project is narrowed down and picked and that way we can get the material that we need on site we can get all the different products that may go into the project we can get that on site so that's why they've been doing it in North Carolina our apprenticeship contest which we use these same uh, projects for our skills is a three-hour contest for the students for the secondary students and our apprenticeship contest we may use the same project but we cut it down to a two-hour project so this was a two-hour project uh, in 2019 at one of our apprenticeship contests in North Carolina and this was one of the projects this year that the instructors had chosen to use out of the three. This was one of the three right here. And of course, nothing was chosen because our skills, uh, like many skills contests across the country, got canceled. So this was one of the three right here that uh, Cliff's building today. And that's how normally the project's picked uh, for your secondary students. And we also in North Carolina use it for our post secondary competition too. That's how the project is normally picked. Ryan, you're 100% correct. But if you look, we have a mix of brick and block. We try to do that to one because we have different suppliers that help out across the nation and we like to include both their products, but two, it gives the students a different mix of materials that have to mix together and make them work. We all know that some block may be slightly smaller than a brick, but that's the challenges you will face on the job site. So we feel like it gives the students a good combination of using the different brick, CMU product and brick to make those come together. We also incorporate a roll lock typically at the top, which is a challenge for a student to put that together. Because it, after you have mixed the, two C, the CMU and the brick, when you get to the top you have to incorporate a roll lock and that is a pretty much a, it's a skill portion that is a, even different than the stretcher courses that Cliff's laying now. 
Cliff is buttering this brick to show you what we're not looking for. He's put a single strike joint on. When he does that, that's going to take off points. Job site or competition, that doesn't pass. But if you'll move to this side and look, see this joint is totally full here and here. We're not as worried about the collar joint, but this head joint is full in both cases. Where Cliff did the single strike, he would have to come back, or if the judge came by at that point, there would be deductions due to that not being a full joint. We've talked many times about full head joints, but if you'll look on the back of this, Cliff has left some of the mortar out so that you can see he's putting a single strike joint on the front of that. But if you can come to the back of the project and see, you can see the hole that's left here. You also see where there's a void on the bed joint portion of this. What we're looking for is once that joint is laid, see how the mortar has been furred so that it comes all the way out of the back of the brick and we know and are sure that we have a good solid head and bed joint. Cliff has removed the brick where we had the improper head and bed joints and as you can see he's furred the mortar so that it goes all the way to the face, it comes all the way to the back side of the brick as well. That's going to ensure that the mortar will be bulged out on the back and as he put on the full head joint you have a full head and bed joint as opposed to what we had a moment ago which was the back void that we had in the bed joint and in the head joint. Cliff's got it spread out here. He's got his mortar furred out. He looks good on how he spread it out. A lot of times we see in a competition that a student will spread it out just like this and start laying that brick and those two wipes will start fighting against each other and get wider than they need to be before the roll lock's installed. So what I'd like Cliff to show is, number one, how we come back on the back side, pull the mortar back away from that other wipe. That way that cavity or that collar is not fighting against the other wipe. And here he's doing it right, just like that right there so he's pulled that back away which is great that way that the, the mortar that's going in that collar joint is not fighting against the other wife and pushing those two brick out wider than what a typical width of a brick is make sure that that fur stays like cliff did so that it still ensures you've got a full joint all the way to the back but that keeps those two brick what happens when you the mortar rolls up this wall here, if you don't fur that back, it causes this to push out. Then when you go to put your roll lock on, you have your two whites that are too wide. So what Cliff has done, he's came in and he set a point brick on each side for his roll lock on the project. After he got those point bricks set, got them level, plumbed up, straight edged, everything was good with his two point brick, and then he started tooling out his project, which is a great idea because it lets these two top bricks set just momentarily while you're tooling out your project, and that way you're ready to put that roll lock on upon completion of tooling on the front and the back. So what he will do is, he will. this is the side that he's was told to check his height on, on the right hand side of the project. He'll lay two more roll lock brick and then he'll use that other point brick on the other end of the project as his guide. So he'll put his four foot level in the middle of the roll lock, then he'll bring it to the front of the roll lock and then the back of the roll lock. Once he gets it good and level, he'll straight edge the front side of the roll lock and then he'll move on and he'll lay three more. That way it keeps him in alignment as his joints, three roll lock brick to each stretcher brick that's laid. He'll work his way all the way down to the end and when he gets to the end, he's going to take Take that end brick off and lay the last couple brick on there. That way he's not fighting trying to lay a closure brick on top of that roll lock. As you talked about a moment ago with the closure brick, that comes into, when he's talking a closure brick, that means if you try to fit another brick as you come down in between this one, it takes just a minute to take this off and then lay it against the other one. What that ensures is that you don't have the top of that brick smeared up with mortar. And then that is going to definitely help you on your general appearance and it also helps on your leveling portion. A moment ago we talked about setting the end brick and as we come back setting two brick each or three brick each time and once that is accomplished we take the level, set it in the middle of the brick from the set brick here to these three brick here, get it level, then move it to the front. Repeat the process, make sure that it's level. Then we move it to the back. 
make sure that it's level, that the level's touching here. And once that's done, we know that we're level with our set brick here, we're level here. Then we take the level and move it to the front and do it, make sure that the brick are straight, that there's a straight edge, there's no gap here. Once that is accomplished, we know that that's going to ensure this roll lock is level from side to side. It's also, by doing it in this fashion, laying three brick at the time, as you look, these three brick are perfectly lined up with the brick below. With a modular brick, three brick equal one of these. So as we come across laying three at the time, we know that our joints are going to stay properly spaced here as well. This is a nice full bed joint that Cliff has got spread on the front and back, both whites of this wall. So before he lays this next roll lock, he's got his mortar spread. I do what's called a little L trick. And I want to make sure that the mortar at the bottom of that roll lock has been cut, and so I just make an L out of it. So I'm, I drag the trowel towards the front of the project. Before I get to the front tip here, I fur it back. That keeps that brick from wanting to fight each other when you lay that roll lock and it goes in nice and smooth and Cliff, uh, Cliff's doing a good job showing that. So the roll lock brick aren't fighting moving each other. You've got a little bit of area down below when you do that little L trick and that keeps those roll lock tight together and easy to level. So Cliff's laying his third roll lock brick right now which will equal that stretcher brick and he'll keep his joints lined up and then we're going to level it. And we're going to level middle then we're going to level the front and then the back and then straight edge. So that's our technique for putting on the roll lock. Kent, Cliff has put he's putting on his roll lock, which he's doing a great job. And what we look for during that process is we see a lot of students start banging the level with the trowel. They'll either use the blade of the trowel on the top of the level, or either they'll use the handle and make just an awful much of racket, beating that down, uh, trying to get that level. So what we'd like to do is as we're laying those three brick, we want to keep them about a trowel width high. That way you can bump them right down to level and get them dead in place for you. So to do that, what is going to do when you lay these three brick right here it's going to put a little bit of air space right there so you got two choices you've got this part of your hand that you use on your trowel that's good and cushioned right here that you can actually bump those brick down into place and take that air space out on that one side that's very quiet it didn't draw any attention and you got your brick perfectly level there so that's just a little another little trick we wanted to talk to you about talk to your students about please don't let them beat the level with the trowel, especially with the blade of the trowel. When you do that, that's part of the thing that a judge may look at, the manipulation of tools. That if you come up and see someone taking the edge of the trowel, beating the brick, that's not going to be a good look on the manipulation of tools. So what we've got here, Cliff has walked this roll lock all the way down to his point brick. He set a point brick on each end, a point brick here and a point brick here. So he walked it from the side that he was knowing that he was going to get his measurements checked on. So he walked it the other way. So now we're left to where we have to either lay a closure brick, but what I refer to and recommend is we take this brick off of the end of the roll lock, clean the little bit of mortar that's there up, lay this brick and then lay this brick last. That way you don't have to fight that closure, worry about it smearing the top of the face of the brick on top of the roll lock, and also you still are buttering and getting a good full joint on the last two brick on the project.
Cliff is at this time has completed his roll lock. And if it holds true, he's done his level portion, as Ryan talked about, walked the roll lock from this end to the other end and completed the roll lock. He is now going over his final tooling and neatness. This is a process that can take several moments. You will see as he, when we get through and show the finished product, what he hopes to have done is removed all mortar burrs, take, made sure that the joint is pulled from end to end. As he comes from this end, he's pushing the jointer away, pulling it back from this corner. That's ensuring that it doesn't knock the corners of these brick out of this mortar out as he comes across. So make sure that as you go to tool the top of this joint, that you push away and pull away from this corner so that it does not knock those out. Cliff has completed the project. He is now cleaning up the excess mortar, and as you can see, he's raking it into a pile up under his mortar pan. He didn't have a lot laid on the ground, but still, that makes the project, the finished portion, look correct. If you will also notice, we put, I think, four brick inside the holes of the block to make to help the coursing better, but we have four left over. And if you come through and see this is all neatly cleaned up, that will also help him as he's going through look and see if there's any imperfections in the wall that he can take care of at that point. We have a finished project now. Our contestant Cliff McGee has finished. We brushed the project down, it's been cleaned up around, and now we're ready to begin the judging process. We have a eight step process that we'll be going over, and we'll show you as we go through the most critical ones and how we arrive at those things. We will also go through how we arrive at general appearance, which seems to be the one that is obviously is subjective and that it is the one that requires the most skill to do. We are ready to begin the plumbing process of the judging. We take this sheet, we have it marked up showing the areas that we're going to plumb. And Ryan is gonna be the one doing it. What I would do would be take this sheet before we started and hand it to Ryan, we would have a judge's briefing and go over and say, Ryan, you're gonna be taking care of plumbing. Here is your four points. We have those labeled on this sheet, but on this sheet we have those points labeled as A, B, C, D. What Ryan does is goes and puts the level on each corner starting at point A and then he will call out to his guy that is assisting him and if there is a deduction they will write it under point A. Then they move on to B. If there is a deduction they write it there. Move to C, then to D and then total your deductions here. We do this so that redundancy is in that we have more than one person just writing a score down. We can have someone then checking and saying are you sure that was a one deduction? Are you sure that was two deductions? And we feel like that gives us a much fairer judging process. At this point Ryan is putting the level, he puts it all the way to the very bottom to the ground because this is where this contest is being judged from then he gets the level plumb once it's plumb he takes the metal wedge you see in his right hand and inserts it in the greatest gap and here it looks like he is showing two deductions as the guy writing that down he will write down two deductions under point a minus t which will be 10 deductions ryan will then take a magic marker a sharpie and write 10 on that corner. We know that at that point there was two deductions taken off. We can come back as a judge knowing that plum is, one of, plum is the biggest one we do. We can come back and very quickly identify where the deductions were. Now he's taking the level and coming from top to bottom at the front. This is classified as point B. There's one deduction at point B, so at this point he'll take right with his Sharpie five on that corner. Then he moves over to point C. We do this and we have these points written in this fashion so that we can assure we get, we cover each point in a, the same sequence each time and by doing that it makes the judging process fair. So we had one deduction on point C. By using the wedge system, it takes the guessing out of it. We can take the step gauge, insert it, then we know exactly how much each 
point comes off and we're not saying this guy looks about so much. This wedge that we use has 10 steps in it and it tells us as we come through each one of these steps is one deduction and it adds here's two. So zero deductions on that corner. So here we could come back in addition to the sheet that we have, we could look we have 10 and 5 is 15 and 5 more is 20. Starting with a possible score of 125, plum on this project would be 105 would be the total score for this. The next step that we're moving to is level. We will take the level and lay it from end to end on the top of the roll lock. It will be in the middle of the roll lock. We have that drawn out on our criteria here. Then facing the front of the project, the left hand in, we will go to the third brick and lay the level from front to back on the third brick. That's the two points we will take with level. At that point, any deductions which will be accumulated using the wedge system, any deductions would be entered into the score sheet and taken off. But I will tell you that before we started, we made it very clear to Cliff that we did not want this to be a perfect project. We wanted deductions so that we could show what we encounter when we're judging these projects in competition. Because when we show this, someone may come up and say, how did I get a deduction there? But this is a true indication of what we normally face. So this is not a perfect project and wasn't intended to be. So Ryan, you take your step gauge and we'll see if there's anything that can insert here. As we're using the step gauge, we do not try to force it. If you can force it in, it's not a point off. We do not take the step gauge and say, okay, we're going to barely pick the level up. We only do it where it will insert. Minus one, which would be five points. So you had minus one at, at level A, at point A. Then he's taking the level and placing it from front to back, and he'll do the same thing here. He'll take the gauge and get the level correct, and that tells him what's off there. Minus one again, which would be five points. So we had five at point A and five at point B, so that's a total of 10, starting with 125. That will be a score of 115. Our next step is measurements. This project is supposed to be measured from the floor up on the right hand end as you're facing the project. The measurement is supposed to be 41 and 3 eighths. For each sixteenth of an inch that's off, that is one deduction which equals five points. Ryan, what do you have on the measurement? Ken, I'm looking at the measurement and we've, we're dead on the money to the top of the roll lock, 41 and 3 eighths, perfect. Cliff messed up there, he was not supposed to do that perfect. Now we're going to measure the roll lock from end to end, and in this particular case, we have it coming down the middle of the roll lock where we're going to put the rule. If you will see, Danks has taken us a hard end, which is wedge, and put it up here so that we can bump the ruler to it and check all the way down. This way we don't have someone's finger or something like that just saying that's about right. By us putting a surface for Ryan to bump the rule into, check down to this end, that gives us the correct measurement. Ryan, what do you have on the measurement from end to end? Kent, he is exactly one-eighth long, which would be two points. So the project's supposed to be 47 and five-eighths. He's just a hair long by two points. So that would be minus two, which would be ten points deducted. So we would have a total score of 115 on the measurements. And as we go through and take, as we showed initially, these notes are printed on each sheet so that that judge can always go back and reference where we're measuring from and where we're measuring to. Range is the next portion that we're doing. We're going to do it in three points. We're going to take the level and place it along the front edge of the roll lock, midway down from top of roll lock, and then we're going to take the level and place it in an X from the top left to the bottom right and from the top right to the bottom left. We will take the wedge at that point and insert it into the greatest area, and that is the deduction for that. So range has a way you can get quite a few deductions off if you're not correct here. Ryan's got the level placed across the front of the roll lock, and now he's coming through with the wedge. Ryan, how many deductions did you have there? Had one deduction, so that'd be minus five. So one deduction so far. Now he's going to start the X pattern. The sequence that we use is we take the level and put it as high as we can go on the front left corner and then let it angle back at the same direction to where it comes to the top course of the block there and then he starts inserting the wedge. We repeat this the same way from the other corner and that way we know again that we get fair judging. 
So how many there? Ken, I've got minus one deduction, so that'd be five more points. So we've got a total of 10 so far. Here's the last piece of the puzzle, the X portion. And as you can see, he's not trying to force the wedge in. He only lets it go in as it will instead of trying to force it in. How many do you have there, Ryan? Ken, I have one more deduction, so that'd be minus five again. So he lost a total of 15, starting with a score of 125. That would have been to a score of 110 is what the final score of range would have been. Our next criteria is production. It starts with a score of 100. So any point of any brick that is not laid, you deduct one point for each unit not laid. And when we go back and look at this one, he's got the full panel laid. He gets all the production points, which is 100. That's a pretty easy judging criteria. So looking at it, this would immediately be marked down as 100. This next criteria would already have been completed. It is full joints. As the projects were being laid, there is usually a minimum of two judges walking through judging full and head and bed joints. They need to be at least 80% filled. As we went through the criteria, we made it show folks putting on the single head joints, not getting bed joints totally full, and with that being the count, as the judge would have already made his decision on whether you made full head and bed joints. This starts at 100 points and for each deduction that the judge takes off is five points as well. Correct design is our next in line. When you go look at this panel we have to make sure that the coursing is done correctly. We would follow the design that is shown here. Looking here it starts out you have one, two, three, four, five, six brick. That's the way the coursing started and if the coursing is started out correctly there it would be correct the rest of the way up. But part of this design as well is to make sure that there is a half eight inch block on the end and then two holes and another half on this end. Also the other part of this design is does he have the four polished face block put in correctly? They are installed correctly. Is his roll lock put on correctly? And it is showing here that you have to have three brick for each stretcher course here. He has that done as well, so he would get the full score of 100 points for the correct design. The last criteria that we have on the project is tooling and neatness or general appearance. This carries a score of 100 as well, and this is done by judges that have quite a bit of experience laying brick because this is something that is subjective. We don't have a wedge to go back and look at this. You don't have a sheet to count and tell how many brick you've laid. It is nothing but subjective. So in this case you want experienced masons to make this happen. I have Cliff McGee and Ryan Shaver that are both here to help me and as I walk up to this project as a mason the first thing that I start noticing is imperfections. I notice here there's another one right here. And so for each one of these, as we come up and see these imperfections, we would first go through and get a range of the whole floor and get the best three to four projects and use that as kind of our judge on how we're going to arrive at the best looking projects. But then we come back and start going down to the individual things that we see and start deducting from there. In this particular one, it's one of the only ones that we check the whole back of the project as well. We're looking there to see is there the same type thing, the burrs in the mortar? Do we have a joint that has been pressed in too deeply when it was tooled? Do we have here where the joiner was not tooled, pulled all the way down before this bed joint was ran? So those are the things we look for. We also look to make sure has it been brushed correctly. Most all the contests that we do, you cannot take a rag and rub the face of these polished block off. There's a little bit of mortar here. We would observe that as we go around and see. If we don't see it on other panels, obviously it will be a deduction here. It's extremely hard to keep these polished bl block clean. But that's part of the tooling and neatness and general appearance that you have to look for. And some may say that items like this are being really picky. But that's what it comes down to in these contests. We are splitting hairs to make that happen. So as we come through and see this here and here, we may look at it and say, okay, that's going to have to be two production, two points knocked off because the other guys did not have that. General appearance is one of the toughest ones that we have to look at because it is, as I said earlier, subjective and it's something that 
you can only tell by having the experience of being a mason. I would also look where this corner has been knocked out with a joiner. Again, that may seem as splitting hairs, but it's a minute amount of mortar that were we on a job site would cause problems down the road. On tooling and neatness and general appearance, this, this criteria looks at the whole project 100%, all the way around. And we really try to, I know it gets down to the wire, so we really try to be fair with this and we try to point out the, the miss things on the project like we've already did. And we also look for areas that weren't tooled correctly, maybe not brushed correctly, and that aren't, aren't to the industry standard. So that's what we're out looking for. So this is a great looking project. We still found a couple things wrong with it. So to be fair, we have to do that with every project on the floor. It takes a little bit of time to do that. But if we do every project the same, like we have all the criteria the same, at the end of that contest, we had a great contest because it was judged correctly. I see about three areas on there that, that possibly could, could bring a deduction. So that would be a 15 point off of that 100 point, which would bring it down to an 85 on this criteria. Ryan, that's how it gets so tight sometimes when we come up on the general appearance and that's some of the that is some of the most questions we get and how did I get a score of 85? My project looked better than his. But if you've had a mason, a journeyman that has laid brick for 20 years looking at that, typically they're not going to make a lot of mistakes. The written test is something that's done at the national level, at National Skills uh, Masonry Competition. I am a co-chair with Jeff Buckowitz with MCAA. We implement a written test that's took the day before the contest. This is normally a 20-question test that's pulled from NCCER, which is the curriculum that's taught nationwide in masonry. Each time a student misses a question, it's a five-point deduction, so it's worth 100 points a well. So our total score is 1,000 points, and that includes that written test. So at the state level, uh, we're going to start that written test. We're, we were going to implement it and start it in 2020, but our state skills was canceled. We actually did a practice test last year just to let the students get a practice at taking that 20-question test. So we hope that NCCER, it comes out of Masonry 1 level book, so we hope that the student will have really studied and do really well on that test. So that's the last criteria to get us up to a thousand points. We hope you guys have enjoyed this video. We put it together today hoping that we can educate all of us and make North Carolina to continue to have the strong tradition that we have had in masonry. Over the years, we have caught some folks that think maybe it's not been judged fairly. But I can assure you, as you have seen today, that between the efforts of Ryan, Cliff, Danks, Lynn, and all the folks that helped put this together, this is something that we don't take lightly. Cliff McGee had built this and he's pushing 50 years old. And Cliff might tell us a little bit about the pressure that you face with having us watch you lay brick. One thing, Ken, I'm past pushing 50. I've turned 50. But I would like to state, um, I've gone and watched a lot of these contests over the years. But today it kind of hit me when we started laying this. It's a little bit nerve-wracking having three or four of your peers watching you lay a panel and trying to do a good job on it. As Ken has stated, we don't have did not want a perfect job, but still I want to do a good job. So my hat's off to all the guys that do this contest and get out in front of hundreds of people and, and try to do a good job. But just remember, lay brick like you can and have a good time. Cliff, thank you for doing this today. I have enjoyed it. We hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Take it and use it in your classroom. And Ryan, thank you for your help again today. And we hope to see you guys soon. To learn more about masonry training and competitions, contact NCMCA Workforce Development and Training Coordinator Ryan Shaver, who can also provide information about masonry pre-apprentice and apprenticeship opportunities. Visit ncmca.com to learn more about the North Carolina Masonry Contractors Association.